Phil. Thanks, Luke. How are you? Good. Good morning, members. We're just here with Luke Partridge, our superintendent here at Manly, as we uh, move closer to finals day. Of course, in fantastic shape, and he's doing a great job here. Um, but Luke, I wanted to talk to the to the club members about course care today, and uh, and understand how we repair divots the right way. So I've just taken a divot here, and um, we see a lot of members actually grabbing grabbing the sod and putting it back into the divot versus putting a bit of sand in it. What, what's your take on the best way to do this? Yeah, Phil. So with a divot like yours here, your best best plan of attack is is actually uh, you since, want to chop since it you in. haven't you haven't completely dislodged it. So, just chopping it in as, as such, pressing it down, and then just enough sand, just to fill in that last little bit is all that's required. Step it in, and so away a, you go. Just a little bit sand, of sand, and then we just smooth it over. Often I see a big big pile of sand over where someone's put too much sand in. Now, what does that do to your mowers? And tell us, walk us through that. Yeah, so putting too much sand, uh, and piling the sand up as such, and we'll clean this up after. Right. Something that's left like that, for example, our mowers with very exp expensive blades will come through, and this sand acts as obviously like a, uh, a sandpaper and um, almost grinds the sharp edge off of our blades. Loves the blades. So you can imagine, you know, many, many piles around, uh, it's going to, you know, completely destroy our, our mowers. So. We like to just keep it as, as minimalistic as possible when it comes to sand. Minimal sand, eh? Yeah. So let's go okay, so we've got different conditions through the year, and obviously we've had a few weeks ago, we had two or three days of rain where we actually had no carts. The course was closed for a day, I think it was. And at that time, members that were, you know, take a big divot, you could often take a divot, you know, nearly the length of your grip, which leaves a long strip. And that's the time where we're trying to avoid the golf is picking up that sod and placing it in perfect and thinking it's going to grow again but it doesn't actually grow back like kaiku or other grasses does it it roots a lot differently it grows from stolons instead of rhizomes which basically means that it'll the divot has better chance of recovery if it creep is if it creeps in together yeah and grows in from the sides yeah. so in review anytime we take a long divot we don't want to replace the sod we want to actually chop it in from the sides walk around this side, you chop it in with the leading edge of the club, a little bit of sand, smooth it over as best as you can and move on to the next uh, move on to the next hole. Before you play your next shot. We just also wanted to let the members know that it is a requirement and a bylaw to carry a sand bucket so when you uh, when you come to golf on arrival in the car park, we have a big tub there of uh, sand buckets, also on the first tee and the 11th tee. So, Luke, you'd ask for everybody's assistance to grab a bucket, fill it full of sand, and just keep replenishing it through the day? Yeah, absolutely, Phil. Finally, just touching on the motorised golf carts, I know that you've got the new GPS system uh, uh, built into the carts where we can, where we can actually control where the carts are able and not able to go. And we're trying to avoid sensitive areas like the native grasses here, obviously the edge of waterways. But as far as approaching the greens, ideally what, what do you want members that use the motorised carts to do with the, with the golf carts? Well, on, on the uh, GPS screen, Phil, it should come up with a geofencing area. So as you're approaching the green, it will tell you that you're driving into a sensitive zone. And if members can just be aware of uh, when they're driving into these zones, just follow path that the GPS gives them. Yeah, and unfortunately what happens is the golf car will conk out, it will stop, and it'll ask you to put it in reverse, and reverse back along the same way. So you kind of feel like you're a beetle on your back, but it's there for a reason to stop members driving into the creek or into a bunker. It's all about safety. It's all about safety, but it's also about um, maintaining our traffic areas and, and being able to manage traffic around the greens. Um, and also to minimise ropes and, and paint on the golf course. Yeah. Well, the other thing we wanted to touch on is just asking our members to help us with the with the wear and tear around the greens with their pool buggy. So what 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 ideally do you want to see the members do with the traffic flow with their with their buggies versus having signs and hoops and directional signs everywhere? What's the best practice for members approaching a green with their equipment? Occasionally, Phil, uh, 
we will have hoops out uh, in between high traffic areas and, and they're moved as traffic dictates uh, and wear dictates. Generally speaking though, uh, as long as buggies are kept on the outside of greens and not pulled across the putting surfaces, um, I think uh, yeah. general, general play uh, will break up the so You pretty much want to minimise members taking buggies between the edge of the green and the bunkers if we can. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. Thanks very much, Luke, and I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to take note and, and really care for their course. Thanks, Phil. Thank you.